<laughs> you know, it's it's because of Adrian that I actually live here. Even um, he would just open his home to my friend Justin and I, and we would just come and visit. And then, you know, when we moved here, we didn't have anywhere to live, so we just crashed on Adrian's couch until we finally got an apartment. And I feel like there's so many people in the room that your story is similar. Like somehow, some way, Adrian's either influenced your life or he's brought you here. And uh, I don't know why I don't do this a lot, but I, I got caught up in looking at the responsibilities of leadership. And Adrian is one of the senior uh, leaders of this ministry. And Adrian uh, started the bank account, right? He, Adrian opened this building to us. I mean, Adrian helped found the ministry And um, I was just thinking about this. I was talking about this. And there's a whole leadership team, right? And a lot of times people, um, and it's an honor. Don't get me wrong. It's an honor. But a lot of times people kind of pin this ministry on Nathan and I. And really, it's this whole leadership team. And and a lot of it really, uh, an overwhelming amount of it is on Adrian. So I'd love if we could just give a round of applause for Adrian. Yeah, man, we honor you. I mean, none of us would be in this room if you didn't open the doors. (laughs) So we love it, man. Uh, I just want to switch gears and kind of dive into something a little heavy. Um, I'm not sure if Danielle is actually here tonight, my girlfriend Danielle. I didn't see her. I don't think she's here. Um, So she's not because she would have raised her hand by now, right? (laughs) Um, Some kind of heavy news with Danielle's family, her nephew, his name is Joseph. He's 13 months old, and he has a brain tumor. And so uh, right now in this moment, I want us to just release faith together for healing. So if you just join me, and if you would just extend a hand towards me as a representation of her family. So Jesus, we love you. And right now together with all of my brothers and sisters, we as sons and daughters, we join our faith to your word, and we command this brain tumor, to shrink and to go right now in Jesus' name. (laughs) Thank you, God. It says that where two or more are gathered in your name, that you are there, God, and that we carry the authority to do your will. And so we just bind it up right now. We bind it up and we cast it out in Jesus' name. So we we look at him in the spirit right now in this moment, and we say, Joseph, we speak wellness over your body. We just command your brain to come into the alignment of the kingdom and for this brain tumor to shrink and to shrivel and to go right now in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And everybody said with a shout, amen, amen. Amen. Be praying for Danielle, for her family, uh, for me and everyone involved with that. And we are believing for healing. So I love you guys. Thank you for joining me in that. Um, So tonight, I want to talk, and if you're taking notes, this is the title of the message tonight, is The Plight of Disillusionment. The Plight of Disillusionment. And so, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about trauma, and then we're going to talk about Jesus and disillusionment. And and I, I just ask that as we roll into this, I might say some hard things, and uh, I'm guilty of not being super empathetic, but I, I truly say this with an empathetic heart. Uh, so please know my heart. But this is, I, I sat down to write this message, and I had the whole message, right, in terms of what I was going to preach from the Bible and the verses and, and all this stuff, all this revelation that I feel like is great and I feel like the Holy Spirit gave me. And before I could start to write it, he started to talk to me about trauma. And if you know me, you know that that's not really in my vocabulary. Uh, For a long, long time, I refused to accept the terms of trauma. I refused, I'd been through a fair amount of trauma in my life, and I refused to admit anything was wrong with me. Uh, I I felt like if if I gave in to this concept of trauma, or that I was a possessor of trauma, that it made me weak, it made me a victim, right? And that's just not the truth. Amen? And it's okay if you've experienced trauma. And it's okay If you're going to counseling, it's okay if you're seeking help with that. And, uh, you know, for the longest time, I lived in this place where it wasn't okay. 
and I almost, and not almost, I definitely demonized counseling, and I've definitely repented of that. Um, but so I, I speak to you with the heart of somebody who's on the other side of that now. But I feel like the Lord started whispering to me, and these are not set in stone rules, right? This is not the only way that trauma happens. Tony sneezing on people. <laughs> Said that on the live stream. Uh, good job, Kyle. Trauma happens. This is what I just feel like the Lord was whispering to me. Trauma happens because of unmet expectations. Trauma happens because of manipulation and abuse. And trauma happens because of disillusionment. These are not the only ways, but this is what I feel like Holy Spirit was laying on my heart. And I feel like it's for multiple people in the room. In fact, when he started to whisper this to me, it really bothered me. Not in like an anxiety way, but it, it, like it burdened me. I felt like it was for multiple people. And so I have three examples that I want to share with you. And, and I hope that you hear the heart of love in it. And, and number one is this. And this is, this is what I got. I'm just going to read it the way I wrote it. You guys cool with that? If you don't understand that you are a son or a daughter of God and what the implications are of being a son or a daughter, then you may create expectations for people, places, and things to give you a sense of purpose, affirmation, belonging, or love. When those expectations go unmet, if you're deeply tied to them, leaning on them, and positioning your life for them instead of as a son or a daughter of God, then these things will cause you pain, they will cause you hurt, and they will cause you trauma. Number two, if you manipulate and abuse people, it's because you feel that you must exploit in some degree in order to gain what you think you don't have. Maybe that's money. Maybe it's power. Maybe it's influence. Maybe it's affirmation. Maybe it's love. Because you don't understand that these are actually a part of your inheritance in the right context of being a child of God, then you cause trauma to people. There's nothing that you need to go out and take that the Lord doesn't want to give to you. Amen? There's nothing that you need to go hurt, lie, cheat, steal, manipulate, or abuse anyone in order to get that he doesn't already want to give to you because he's a good father, and the Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights. Do you believe that? My third example, this was the one that I, I need you to have a heart to hear me and to know that I would never condemn, I would never accuse, and I say this with love. I want to talk about disillusionment, and this is actually what my entire message will be about, is disillusionment happens when you become convinced of a set outcome which was never going to happen because it either involves another party's free will or it wasn't ever part of your gift and calling, but you reached hard for it anyway. Listen, this is delicate, so hear me the right way. I have been a Christian for 12 years, 13 years, and I have seen time and time and time and time again in the church with young adults, right now where a lot of you are at in your age, you get a word from a friend or a word that you're supposed to marry so-and-so and that you're going to marry them. And I know it's funny because it's relevant, but I've also seen the extreme side of it where people's lives get wrecked. There's a reason we train people at the, at, in, in the prophetic and we say when you prophesy to people, don't prophesy to them about dates because you don't control the timing of the Lord. Don't prophesy them to them about mates, someone they would marry, because you don't, Control the Lord doesn't control people's free will to choose another person freely. And you don't prophesy about babies, right? Because it sounds funny, but like imagine telling somebody who is infertile, the Lord's going to give you a baby, and then he doesn't. The confusion, the trauma, the pain, the hurt, all of it. And, I, and I've seen all of it, right? I've seen all of it. And I've seen people get deeply wounded. And so I would say this. I want to reiterate what I said. 
if you become convinced of a set outcome which was never going to happen because it either involves another party's free will or it wasn't ever part of your gift and calling, but you reached hard for it anyway, it doesn't mean that you're going to have trauma, but it does mean that you're setting yourself up in a shaky place. You guys with me? I have a buddy. He's a good friend of mine. And he was convinced that he was called to ministry. I mean, just absolutely convinced. He, he didn't necessarily hear it from the Lord, but he was convinced. He, he wanted the microphone. He wanted the stage. He wanted the, the, I don't know, the spotlight. He wanted to speak on that level. And I think that knowing that he had influence on his life was right. It was correct. It was good. And knowing that he was called to speak to people was right. It was correct. It was good. But he wanted to do it in a ministry context, and the Lord never spoke it to him. And so he spent a very large portion of his life positioning in front of people, serving people out of a sense of obligation, and really sowing into things that had nothing to do with his calling because he thought if he could do this, he could do this, he could do this, he could work, he could serve, he could show up early and go home late, that someone would put a microphone in his hand. And one day he had a dream, and the Lord showed him in the dream that he got the microphone that he wanted and nobody listened to him. And it rocked him. And he was like, he woke up and he was like, Lord, what was that? And the Lord said, I didn't call you to traditional ministry. Ministry is a part of your life. If you're a believer, this is what Morgan was talking about. If you're a believer, ministry is part of your life. It's a lifestyle. When you walk out of here, the goal and the hope is that you've been equipped and you take the beautiful news of the gospel out, right? And you just demonstrate it with your life. And people take those umbrellas down and they let the reign of God just meet them, get absolutely drenched in it, right? And so he, he has this dream and he prays into it. And the Lord says, actually, I called you to the marketplace, but you were too busy for years posturing yourself and positioning yourself to inherit a microphone that I didn't want you to have because I have something completely different from you. And so he's like, all right, what do you want me to do in the marketplace? And he got involved in business. And I'm, I'm not going to say who it is or a lot of people would probably know him, but he found his niche in business and there's a clear anointing. The man is a millionaire now. He, I'm telling you, he went, he went from making $14 an hour and running himself ragged and barely being able to supply for his family because he thought we, that he didn't need this microphone. <laughs> and now he's a millionaire, right? And, and there's something to that, right? He, he, what if he never listened to the Lord and he never got the microphone? Or worse, he got the microphone and he never had the influence, then the trauma comes, but he heard the Lord. And so my challenge is trauma is deep-seated mental, spiritual, and physical imbalance that can take years to sort out. And I just want you to ask yourself and ask the Holy Spirit, are you setting yourself up for this? You know, God wants to totally lead you, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct my paths, right? You guys good? Yeah, that was kind of heavy, right? All right, cool. <laughs> Elijah, what's up, man? I give Elijah a ride several times a week to and from up here, and we call him Young Master Elijah. I think that's funny. <laughs> All right, so the plight of disillusionment. This is what I feel like the Holy Spirit's showing me. And I want to tell you that Jesus is completely against you being disillusioned. Right? And so, he wants you to have his mind. He wants you to understand his plans. And we say that, and that's cliche, and you hear it in church a lot. But the Bible tells us this. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 2.16, I'm going to read it. It says, Who has ever intimately known the mind of Yahweh well enough to become his counselor? Jesus has, and we possess Jesus' perceptions. Do you believe that? You possess the thoughts of Christ. Come on, amen? John 15, 15, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says, I have never called you servants because a master doesn't condemn or doesn't confide in his servants and his servants don't always know what the master is doing. But I 
call you my most intimate and cherished friends. For I reveal to you everything that I've heard from my Father. Jesus wants to keep you from disillusionment. He wants to keep you from trauma. How? By sharing his heart with you. By sharing his mind with you. Right? Last time I preached, how many of you were here last time that I spoke? A couple of you. Yeah? So last time I, I preached out of Luke 19, and it was the parable of the servants who uh, the king inherited a kingdom, and he, he gave a bunch of stewards uh, the right to govern in his place. Do you guys remember that when I talked about that? So before that, leading up to that, it says this in Luke 19, 11, and 12. It says, at this time, Jesus was getting close to entering Jerusalem. The crowds that followed him were convinced that God's kingdom realm would be fully manifest when Jesus established it in Jerusalem. So, he told them this story to change their perspective because they were disillusioned. They were thinking the wrong thing and they had tied themselves deeply to the wrong thing about Jesus. They believed deeply that Jesus was going to roll up in Jerusalem and have a military and political coup. And he was going to overthrow Rome and he was going to take back Jerusalem and they were going to enter into the messianic age and they were going to rule and reign and they were going to have all this political power and authority and they were going to be a military power again like what you read in the Old Testament. Are you with me? You see... The Jews, they, ha they, had, they had a messianic paradigm. They still do have a messianic paradigm. They believe, and they believed before Jesus got here, they believed that a Messiah was coming. But they didn't believe that the Messiah was God. They believed that the, the Messiah was just a man who is endowed with power from God. So when I say this, I want you to think like Elijah, Elisha, Right? Some of these prophets that perform these mighty miracles in the Old Testament, these, these, these prophets who were the messengers of Yahweh God, and they anointed kings, and they controlled the political destiny of this nation, right? And so they believed that a Messiah was coming. They didn't believe that the Messiah was God. They just believed in a political military figure who is going to come and free them from the oppression of Rome. Are you with me? And Jesus told them, two different stories in order to get them to stop thinking that because they were disillusioned. They were very bought in to the wrong thing. I'm going to read something. You guys good with that? It's long. All right. Luke 19, 28 through 44. I'm reading out of the Passion Translation if you're following along with me. If you're not, that's Okay. After saying all of this, Jesus headed straight to Jerusalem. When he arrived at the stables of Ananiah near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples ahead of him, saying, When you enter the next village, you will find tethered there a donkey's young colt that has never been ridden. Say, never been ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. And if anyone stops you and asks, What are you doing? Just tell them this. It is needed for the Lord of all. The two who were sent entered the village and found the colt exactly like Jesus had said. While they were untying the colt, the owners approached them and asked, What are you doing? The disciples replied, We need this donkey for the Lord of all. They brought the colt to Jesus. Then they placed their prayer shawls, say prayer shawls, on its back, and Jesus rode it as he descended the Mount of Olives toward the city of Jerusalem. As he rode along, people spontaneously threw their prayer shawls on the path in front of him like a carpet. As soon as he got to the bottom of the Mount of Olives, the crowds of his followers shouted with a loud outburst of ecstatic joy over all of the mighty wonders and power they had witnessed from Jesus. They shouted over and over, highest praises to God for the one who for the one who comes as king in the name of the Lord. Heaven's peace and glory from the highest realm now comes to us. Some Jewish religious leaders who stood off from the procession said to Jesus, Teacher, you must order your followers to stop at once from saying these things. And Jesus responded to them, Listen, listen to me. If my followers were silenced, 
the very stones would break forth with praises. But catch this. It goes on to say, when Jesus caught sight of the city of Jerusalem, he burst into tears with uncontrollable weeping over Jerusalem, saying, if only you could recognize that this day, peace is within your reach, but you can't see it. They were still disillusioned. They could not see it. They couldn't see ultimately what Jesus was wanting to do, why he came, why he was there, what was actually happening in that moment. They were so blinded by their political ideology and their political theology of who they thought the Messiah, they fully believed at this point that he was the Messiah. They were completely given to the idea that he was the Messiah. They did not know or believe, nor could they possess the paradigm that it was God in the flesh. And they could not understand that he was bringing peace and redemption to them, but it was going to be a spiritual inheritance that they would have to walk out with inherited authority as a son or a daughter of God. They thought that they were going to rule and reign, right? Militaristically. And this whole thing, I found myself pondering on it. I'm like asking the Lord, why the donkey's colt. Why did he have to ride on that, right? And fortunately, there's footnotes, and it points to verses. And apparently, one of the prophets, Zechariah, in chapter 9, verse 9 of Zechariah, he prophesies that the coming Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt. And so Jesus is making a very obvious statement by getting on this donkey and riding it into Jerusalem. He's very boldly saying, I am the Messiah that you think I am. But it goes even deeper than that. Listen, brief, brief recap. In the Old Testament, there's a story of a king named Jehu. Some of you are probably familiar. And at the time, he was the, he was, he, he became, he was anointed as the king of Israel. But before he was anointed, there was another king named Ahab. And he had a wife named Jezebel. Does that name sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Ahab and Jezebel partnered together, and they brought Israel down to their knees. They led Israel into deep, deep wickedness, idol worship. The list goes on. There's a reason why, even if you haven't read the story, you know the name Jezebel. She famously influenced Ahab, and Ahab famously brought Israel down to a fraction of what they were. But Elisha, the prophet, stick with me here, stay tuned. Don't lose me on this. Elisha anointed Jehu as king, despite the fact that Ahab was still king. And Elisha said, you're going to redeem Israel. You're going to get rid of Ahab and Jezebel, and you're going to bring the nation of Israel back to the Lord. And I anoint you king over Israel right now. And all of the witnesses who were there with Jehu, they tore off their robes, and they placed them in a pile because it was an act of saying, we're, we're creating a throne for you. Sit on this. Sit down on this throne. We know that it's a prophetic declaration. We know this is not a real throne. But this is symbolic that we give you authority. We submit to the prophet. The prophet's word that you are the king and we are now with you. As you set forth and do whatever it is that you need to do. And so it answered my second question. Because when Jesus got this donkey's colt. The disciples who were with him, they tore their prayer shawls off and they piled it on top of this donkey. Are you with me? And they're saying to Jesus, we know that you're the Redeemer. We know that you're the Messiah. And just like Jehu was able to redeem Israel, we know that that's what you're about to do right now in this moment. So please don't sit on the bare back of this donkey as you ride in triumphantly into Jerusalem. Please sit on this throne, which is symbolic that we submit to your authority and that we're with you till the end. It hasn't gotten good yet, y'all. We're about to break it open here. Y'all with me? So I had a question, right? I'm like, Lord, I read Zechariah 9.9, and it it said, you know, the the Messiah would ride on on a donkey's colt, but it doesn't say anything about an unridden colt, a colt, unridden colt, a colt that had never been sat on. I'm like, so why? Why does it say, why did Jesus specifically say there will be a donkey that has never been ridden on? 
and I heard Jesus answer me with a question, and he said, what do you know about donkeys? It's funny. You're allowed to laugh. There's a couple people that are like silently laughing. And I answered the Lord, and I said, this is what I know about donkeys, is they live hard lives. They're always in service to people. They're always carrying people. They're always carrying tools. They're always carrying loads. They're always pulling something. People pack them down with heavy stuff, and they work in grueling conditions. Amen? This is the existence of a donkey. They live a demanding performance, work-based life. And then when they get too old, they get shot. (laughs) Serious. But then I Googled donkeys. Yeah. (laughs) You want to have your mind blown? When a donkey is out to pasture and it's actually not working, did you know that a donkey naturally assumes a guardian role over sheep and other livestock? Like a donkey will actually herd the other animals. It will get them to walk in the direction that they need to go. And these animals, these donkeys will actually protect animals from predators. They actually assume a natural shepherding role. Do you see the parallel? Okay. But this, this was great, right? Because obviously Jesus is riding in on this donkey and donkeys are like natural shepherds and Jesus is making this, everything Jesus is doing here is a prophetic declaration that he's the Messiah, that he's going to be the shepherd, right? But it it still didn't answer my question. I was like, Lord, that was amazing. But why did the donkey, (laughs) why did the donkey have to be unridden? And uh, Jacob and Alexis and, and Monica, if you guys want to come back up, you can, um, wherever you are. You're out there somewhere. Um, it's actually really hard to see up here. Unridden. Okay, so why? Well, I finally decided, okay, you know what? I'll do the, the thing that I went to school for, and I'll look it up in the Greek, and I'll actually see what the word unridden means. And it's actually a phrase that's transliterated. And it means that the donkey's never been sat on, right? Go surprise, surprise. Unridden, never been sat on, right? But the word sat in the Greek is the word kathizo. Don't miss this. This is really important. Kathizo means to set or appoint, to confer or bestow upon someone a kingdom. This donkey had never had a mantle, a paradigm, a kingdom of work, performance, service out of obligation, enslavement. He had never had that paradigm translated onto his life. This donkey was spoiled. It had never been sat on. And when Jesus sat down on this donkey who had never been ridden, had never had to work and strive and perform for its master. This animal who apparently, when it's not doing that, is a shepherd. He sat down on that donkey and rode into Jerusalem and he said, I come to you prophetically as the Redeemer King of Israel that you think that I am. I am the Messiah. But I do not come in the name of performance. I do not come in the name of religion. I do not come in the name of works where you try to earn something and perform for somebody. Are you with me? Jesus was not trying to translate to us a paradigm of religion and striving. Nonetheless, Jesus' disciples were disillusioned in this moment. His followers still disillusioned, despite all of this. They mimicked Jehu's soldiers from the Old Testament. They built Jesus a makeshift throne of prayer shawls on the back of this donkey, which I'm convinced, 
even though they did it because of disillusionment. It still served a prophetic purpose that there was a kingdom, a new kingdom, a new throne is being established, and it's on the unridden paradigm. It's on the paradigm of rest. It's on the paradigm of protection, shepherding. Jesus' followers, they went wild. There's a procession. They're dancing. They're shouting. It's, just, it's such a scene that the religious leaders are like, you've got to squash this. This is going to get us in trouble. Right? You have to read between the lines a little bit. Not only were they worried about their reputations, but they also thought they were going to get in trouble with Rome. Luke 19, 42. 41 and 42. It says, When Jesus caught sight of the city, he burst into tears with uncontrollable weeping over Jerusalem, saying, If only you could recognize. If only you could have the paradigm. If only you could see what I'm doing right now. That peace is within your reach but you can't see it. They couldn't see it because they were disillusioned. I looked up, the, the, the verse that I just read to you, I looked it up in the Greek too, and I want to read this over you. And We're going to just naturally go into a time of worship here, and, and I want you to know that as soon as I'm done speaking, that you are absolutely dismissed. And you can leave if you have to leave. You can go outside and have conversation. But until about 9.15, we'll be in here just hanging out, just in the presence of the Lord. Whatever it is that he has for you to receive, I encourage you to receive it. But it says this when you translate it, the Kyle translation, if you will. So take it with a grain of salt. But it says, if only you could intimately know, intimately understand in this day and age, of face-to-face -face rest, this paradigm of being fixed, immovable in relationship, and the advantage of my way which leads to peace. If only you could know. If only you could understand. If only you could have this paradigm. But for now, it is kept secret from your mind's eye. Maybe this is a little heavy tonight, but... I really, truly felt burdened by the Holy Spirit because I, I think freedom sometimes, look, sometimes looks like saying, wait a minute, what am I believing? What do I believe? Maybe some of you don't believe that God is good and you need that to break, man, because God is good. And he loves you. He's proud of you. He doesn't hate you. He doesn't condemn you. You won't find that in the Bible. You won't find that in Jesus. Maybe some of you believe that he doesn't speak to you. Right? And maybe you have a paradigm that God doesn't speak anymore, that he stopped doing that 2,000 years ago. That was for a certain time, and now I'm just required to be a Christian and just believe and just believe, and one day I'm going to get to heaven. I'm going to behave. I'm telling you, man, he still speaks. You think about the prophet and the servant, and they they traveled everywhere together, and, and I believe it was Elijah, maybe it was Elisha. One of you smarter theologians can help me out. But the Lord was speaking to him, and all these things happened, and it was there was a fire that came, and, and the Lord wasn't in the fire. There was an earthquake that came, and the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. There was a wind that came, and the Lord was not in the wind. And then the still small voice came. And that doesn't mean that the Lord's voice isn't in the fire, isn't in the wind or the earthquake, it just means that in that moment, he had to tune in relationally and figure it out. And I don't even know why I'm saying this other than to tell you that just because you didn't hear the Lord speak to you one way or two ways or three ways doesn't mean that he doesn't want to speak to you. And it just requires a drawing near, right? Right? 
So let's just stand to our feet because I, I think I made my point. Can you just hold your hand out like this just to receive for a second? Jesus, we love you. God, we want to be whole. We want to be healthy, mentally, physically, spiritually. We want to possess the correct paradigm. Listen, the word salvation in the Greek, it means saved, healed, and delivered. And so, God, if you want to deliver us from incorrect thought patterns, incorrect paradigms, God, if you want to heal our broken bodies, if there's something you're dealing with tonight, a physical ailment, then I'm believing and we're believing for healing for you tonight. And we just release it right now in Jesus' name. Full healing over your body, full healing over your mind. In Jesus' name, we just declare the salvation of the Lord, which is... <laughs> to be saved, healed, and delivered. Just receive that right now. And, and, and like I said, you're absolutely dismissed in this moment if you need to go. We're just gonna, we're just gonna have music for about 12 minutes here. And, and I just wanna encourage you to just soak in the Lord. Just soak in his presence. Let him speak to you. So God, our minds are open, our ears are open, our eyes are open, and we just declare that we are yours, Jesus. We love you, God. Amen.